The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. Hey, what's up, everybody? Happy Thursday. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay, good Lord, what is going on in this world? Seriously, man, a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff over the past two days. I wanted to kind of talk about a couple current events before we get into some more things. First of all, the first thing that was interesting was, so Biden and Trump looks like they've both secured enough delegates to get the nomination. Okay, no surprise there. RFK Jr., who has really been making noise as an independent, I mean, I think that was a smart move because I don't think there was any chance he was going to be able to sort of beat out Biden for the Democratic nomination. So he's definitely, you know, he's been rallying his base of support as an independent and then made an announcement yesterday which said he's going to announce his VP candidate in on March 26th in Oakland. And so there's been a lot of rumors about that VP candidate being either New York Jets, former Green Bay Packers quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, or Jesse the Body Ventura. Remember that dude? The professional wrestler turned governor of Minnesota. I will say Jesse the Body Ventura, that guy is a smart dude. And man... I ironically was talking to a friend about him a couple weeks ago. I, I thought he died. I literally thought he died because if you remember, he was one of the original, I mean, I'm going to call him a conspiracy theorist, but I don't think he is a conspiracy theorist. I think he's a theorist because honestly, I remember a lot of his stuff in regards to 9-11 and those situations. They made a lot of sense to me. They really did. And, you know, that guy's an original call a spade a spade guy for sure. And he's big enough physically to handle it in case somebody wants to challenge him on it in a physical altercation. <laughs> but no, Jesse, the body Ventura, I mean... Man, he was pretty prominent. Uh, I'm pretty sure he had a TV talk show for a while. All right, this is hilarious. He literally had a TV show called Conspiracy Theory. <laughs> Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura from 2009 to 2012. Three seasons of that. But, you know, since 2012, you just have never heard from him. I, I'm very surprised. I really don't remember him being front and center, you know, during the Trump years. I don't remember him at all being front and center during COVID. So 2020 to 2024, you know, you would think, man, talk about a conspiracy theory in COVID. That would have been something he would have chimed in on big time. But you don't hear, you didn't hear from him. So like this was very surprising that all of a sudden out of nowhere, Jesse Ventura's name comes into the VP mix for RFK Jr. Aaron Rodgers makes a little more sense because Aaron Rodgers has been very vocal about his support for RFK Jr. And I think those two guys have a good relationship. So that definitely makes some more sense. I will say this. I do not think he should pick either one of those guys. They... Again, nothing to do with their stances or credibility or anything like that. I'm not even judging that. It's just bad optics. Like the optics of it just don't work. And, you know, you've got a lot of people. And again, I think they're wrong, but you've got a lot of people with a negative view of Aaron Rodgers' politics. And then you have other people that simply cannot you know, accept a NFL quarterback being in politics. I mean, that's like almost like, I don't know, sports racist or something like that. But overall, 
I don't think either one of those guys are going to propel him forward. There's some talk about Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, that might make more sense. Those those two align politically. You know, Tulsi Gabbard was a Democrat, and then she basically, I think she also became an independent. I know she left the Democratic Party. So anyway, we'll see what happens. The fact that it's in Oakland, California, his announcement has me leaning Aaron Rodgers because he's from Chico, California, which is like 40, 45 minutes outside of Oakland. So I thought maybe they're going to leverage it to do that. And then I thought, oh, maybe it's MC, <laughs> MC Hammer. Maybe it's going to be MC Hammer. MC Hammer's from the Oak Town. That would be amazing. Oh my God. Can you imagine if it, if he's like, and my vice presidential candidate is... Too legit, too legit to quit. Hey, hey, too legit. And then Hammer comes with his like baggy pants and he's like sashaying across the stage doing the MC Hammer dance. Oh my God. I will go on record saying right now, I will absolutely vote for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. if he makes MC Hammer his vice presidential candidate and Hammer does the Hammer dance across the stage. That's got my vote. What a circus everything has turned out to be. All right, let's move on. A couple other things that were interesting, you know, after several months of, you know, Ukraine not really being in the mix, all of a sudden, the Biden administration announced a new $300 million weapons package for Ukraine. God, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't really know what that means. Is that like, there's 300 million, I guess, worthless weapons that, the U S wants to get rid of. So we're just going to give it to Ukraine or if that's new funding. I mean, I don't think that's cash. I think that's the value of the weapons, but again, you know, the, the here, here, here's what seems to be happening. It's like they give Ukraine these weapons and then I don't know, do the weapons manufacturers get a massive, massive, tax write off and then basically you know is there is there funding passed by the government in one of these omnibus bills you know we have literally a i think 60 billion dollar bill sitting with congress in order to pass a big chunk of that goes quote unquote to ukraine but then here's the question like we don't really know how that all flows. So like what I'm thinking is the case, and I really do think this is the case. I think like this 300 million is like back stock or out of or product. That's, I mean, I'm kidding when I say out of stock, but, or I'm sorry, I'm kidding when I kind of position it as expiring product. It's not really expiring. There's no expiration date on military stuff. I don't think, but the point is, is this a is this a quid pro quo with these defense manufacturers where they're like, okay, here, give those to Ukraine. That's like last year's model. And we're gonna, as soon as we pass this omnibus spending package, which we've talked about so many times, you know, we're going to place an order with you guys for a billion dollars worth of new stuff for us here in the U S I have to imagine that is what's taking place. They are basically donating the older equipment arsenal, all that stuff. And then they're going to place a new purchase order for, you know, a billion dollars worth of new stuff, probably more than that even. So Anyway, man, those are some crazy numbers. Those are some crazy numbers. It would be great if one of these politicians would kind of peel back the curtain on that and let everybody know how this stuff actually goes down. But I doubt that'll ever happen. I think the only guy that would even remotely touch that topic is Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. He's been very outspoken about the the spending with Ukraine and really all of military spending over the past many years. 
But if anybody would do it, it'd be Rand Paul, but I don't even think he would have the guts to do that. All right, moving on, a couple other topics that were interesting. Man, there's some crazy plane safety stuff that's been happening. It happened again on a Alaska Airlines flight where the door the door plug blew off the side of the plane shortly after takeoff. So like, what is going on with these planes? I'll be honest. I, I'm not very eager to fly these days. I'm really not like there's just too much weird stuff that's happening. Like doors are flying off. Windows are, are like cracking open. I don't know, man. I don't know if it, it, I'm not going to lie. It's definitely got me freaked out a little bit in terms of flying. I really, I hate to say that and I hate to like live life like that, but, but I don't know. I mean, man, it, it does make me second guess taking trips that, you know, aren't, aren't, let's say vital on the business side of things. Cause there's just too much I don't know. Or, or here's the other side of it. Or maybe again, we live in this hyper info information heavy world. You know, maybe this stuff has happened all along and we just now hear about it more often. I mean, that could be the case. I almost hope that is the case. So anyway, plane safety, another interesting thing that's been taking place lately. All right, the last thing from the current event stuff that I wanted to talk about is, man, I, I don't know if this is just a California thing. I can't imagine it is, but God, things are so expensive these days. Like going out to a restaurant is crazy expensive. I'm not even kidding. I can't, I can't get out of dinner for two people, let's say. And again, just normal dinner and let's say one drink, right? One drink each, maybe. I mean, that's that's like 200 bucks. That is like $200 for dinner and a drink. And again, it probably cost that same thing years back, but, you know, at least then it was like, let's say one of the top, top restaurants. I'm not talking top, top, but like, you know, a really good restaurant, you'd come out of there for two people for about 200, something like that, right? Now... You go to a mid-level restaurant and those are the prices. And then groceries as well. You know, I, I have to imagine the entire country is grappling with this. Maybe not as bad in other parts besides California and New York maybe or Chicago, San Francisco, you know, the big cities. But prices are prices are incredibly high. They are incredibly high. All right, shifting gears. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. I led the country through the COVID crisis. Today, we have the strongest economy in the world. I passed a law that lowers prescription drug prices. Caps insulin at $35 a month for seniors. For four years, Donald Trump tried to pass an infrastructure law, and he failed. I got it done. Now we're rebuilding America. I passed the biggest law in history to combat climate change because our future depends on it. Donald Trump took away the freedom of women to choose. I'm determined to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. Donald Trump believes the job of the president is to take care of Donald Trump. I believe the job of the president is to fight for you, the American people, and that's what I'm doing. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Can we do one more take? Look, I'm very young, energetic, and handsome. What the hell am I doing this for? All right, so that was obviously President Biden, and that was his first ad coming out of really securing the Democratic nomination with the delegates. And so the reason I played that is this is more of like a marketing, a marketing uh, observation. So, you know, for a few weeks now, and I played several things about this, I was very surprised at like Hillary Clinton talking about Biden being old, Nancy Pelosi talking about Biden being old, even Gavin Newsom talking about Biden being old. Now, I don't know if that stuff was done on purpose or because of that stuff. And, you know, obviously 
the the talk about him being bold. So they're leaning into it now. They're absolutely leaning into it. This first ad, you know, starts off with saying, "Hey, I you know, I know I'm not young." So they're really embracing his age and I think that that's going to continue and they're going to Gosh, it's like, this is actually advice my brother gave me. I will give my brother credit. I remember when I was first interviewing for for jobs, like actually for internships even, I think my sophomore year in college, my brother told me that he said, okay, they're going to ask you, you know, what are your greatest weaknesses? And what you need to do is you need to take your weaknesses and turn them into strengths. And I was like, well, what the hell does that mean? Give me an example. And he's like, well, here's an example. You could say that you like to get involved in so many things, but sometimes that spreads you thin. And so you realize that even though you want to get involved in a lot of things, you probably need to prioritize better. So that's kind of a weakness, but then you're turning it into a strength because it you're showing them that, you know, you like to be involved in so many things. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good shit. <laughs> so, so I think, I don't know, maybe my brother is consulting for the Biden administration now, but they, they basically did exactly that. You know, they're turning the table on this age thing and they're leaning into it and they're going to try and make it a strength. The other interesting thing I thought about that ad, and this is the first time, and he, he didn't even do this in the state of the union address for those, you know, seven of you that watched that the other night, he mentioned Trump's name. He always previously would just refer to him as my predecessor, my predecessor, my predecessor. He never would say Donald Trump or Trump. He never says President Trump, but that ad, he does say Trump by name. So I thought that was interesting as well. So he's kind of, you know, attacking him directly. All right. A couple other things. Oh my God. Did you guys hear or see the Kate Middleton graphic design controversy? Good Lord. That's <laughs> there was actually some funny stuff about that. Anyway, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, Kate Middleton, I don't even know what her title is. I'm not down with those royals, and we will never be royals. That's a little bit of Lord, that song by Lord. Anyway, Kate Middleton, she's married to Prince William. I guess it was Mother's Day in England, and she posted a picture of her and the three kids. And I guess it turned out to be pretty much photoshopped. The whole picture was either photoshopped or parts of it were photoshopped. And so I have no idea how people figured it out because I've looked at the picture and I know Photoshop pretty well. I could not figure that out. But like some fan was like, wait a minute, that's the same face that was used in the you know, the Vogue magazine cover with her. And then it just became insane how much they analyzed and literally figured out all the things that have been altered. And so I guess then Kate Middleton and Prince William came out on their Twitter or something and they said, oh, sorry. Yeah, like many, many moms, I'm a aspiring aspiring photographer and graphic artist. So they didn't fess up to it necessarily. They just kind of said they filtered it and changed it. But the controversy is, I guess, supposedly she has had abdominal issues. And so they're saying that maybe there's a bigger picture health situation going on with her at the same time. There's like rumors of Prince William uh, cheating on her, which I don't know, dude, that bald, that bald, that bald, bro. I don't see him doing that. Although the only reason I don't see him doing that is not because he's bald, but because, you know, that guy, that guy likes his life, you know, unlike Prince Harry who decided, oh, this isn't for me. And, you know, that's a whole different topic. I feel like Prince William has bought into this program. You know, he's down with all this stuff. He's down with everything that comes with and is part of, you know, being part of this royal family. So I don't know. I don't see him wanting to risk that, although his dad did. 
but I think he's very, very different than Prince Charles. Prince Charles kind of was always like the, the, he was always kind of like the screw up kid. I, I really think he was. Yeah, he absolutely was. He's always like the screw up kid. Whereas William is not, you know, he's always definitely been like, you know, he's played the role. He's played the role and he's done it well, I think. So I don't know. So we've got some royal controversy across the pond. I don't support a ban on TikTok for First Amendment reasons. I mean, you have both the left and the right on a platform that is anti-establishment, that is offering views that actually you don't often hear, and sometimes on uh, in the mainstream media. And so I think we have to protect speech. Now, is there a concern about our data being taken by providers that could get to the Chinese Communist Party? Yes, that's a concern not just on TikTok, it's on other platforms that sell the data brokers, which is why we need a data privacy internet bill of rights to address that problem instead of a blanket. All right, so that was California Democrat Congressman Ro Khanna. Ro Khanna has actually been dropping some knowledge bombs on a variety of things I really that I've really liked, actually. And, you know... We talked about TikTok in the previous episode and a few other episodes. And so the House of Representatives, which is Republican led, passed some legislation or the legislation to to basically, you know, I I, I don't really know if it's a banning TikTok in the United States or if they're going to try and make ByteDance, who is the parent company, basically sell TikTok to a US based entity so that not only the data is guaranteed to be stored in the United States, but I think also the developers and all those working on it basically are all US based versus being Chinese based, which that in and of itself, I mean, I think half of the developers for all these companies, including Apple, Google, Tesla, Amazon, all that, I'm sure more than half of this workforce is not in the United States on the development side, or at least that work is outsourced outside of the United States. So this entire TikTok thing, it is absolutely the Trojan horse for a couple of reasons. And and I'll and I'll end today by kind of just trying to reemphasize this point. One is, so TikTok really has emerged as this platform for, you know, it, it's kind of anti-establishment information. You go on TikTok and you look things up and, you know, perfect example being, this is where probably your kids live, you know, your kids and this will be a good question. You guys should ask your kids, like, are they on TikTok more than Instagram? Probably. Uh, they're definitely not on Facebook. So if anything, I think Snapchat gets used by Gen Z and the millennials, but that's a different use. You know, that's more of like, I think within their network of friends, they use Snapchat for that. Outside of that though, I really think TikTok is the place that these kids live and that's where they're having their voices heard. Now, getting rid of TikTok or it, let's say let's say the plan was to try and ban TikTok in the United States, you know, in many ways you're taking away the platform for the younger generation to have their voices heard. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. I really do. And I think that's incredibly demoralizing for that entire generation. You're talking about a generation of kids that wants to be heard. And if you take away the platform that they're using to express themselves and be heard, I think that could have tremendous, tremendous, bigger picture, longer term implications on, on society in general. And the creativity of an entire generation. You know, now you're talking about like, I don't know, man, that's big picture stuff. That's big picture stuff. I can't say I I, I can really understand what the, the, the big impact of that would be. But I absolutely think there would be a, a massive, massive impact. And so this entire thing with TikTok, you know, it's... I, I don't think it's just about national security. I think it's it's under the guise of national security. We've got 
the election that we're going into. It's definitely a way to, I don't want to say silence voices, but, you know, extremely limit. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Extremely limit opposing viewpoints and opposing voices. And, you know, I think the thing you have to decide is, especially being in the United States of America and what the United States of America has always stood for, which is freedom of speech. You know, what are the, what are the constraints of that, you know, and, and who gets to judge that? Who gets to determine, okay, that's appropriate. That's not appropriate. I mean, slippery, slippery slope. Anyway, we'll see what happens with this TikTok. I will say my, the final thing on that and what I think was the most interesting is, and this is pretty insane if you think about it. So this TikTok ban, do you remember? This was happening in right around this time, maybe over the next few months of 2020. Remember that? 2020 with Trump and then he talked about, oh, is Oracle going to buy it? Is Microsoft going to buy it? So this TikTok debate was in 2020, right? During COVID and all of that and the election. And then what happened? It went dormant for three years. We really haven't heard that much about it. We heard a little bit about it last year. And I think I've talked about that a few times uh, or even earlier this year, but not, not to the extent that it is rearing its head again. And now here we are going into the election and it is front and center again. It is front and center. And I think it's going to come to a head, come to a head. All right, everybody have a great day and call that spade a spade when you see it. And we'll talk to you soon. The ending was terrific. This episode is being brought to you by the upcoming book, Deep Shallow Dive Into You. That's right, bro wrote a book, and it's coming soon. Stay tuned.